All right, welcome to episode 21 of the Superlative Podcast. We are going to be talking all things you need to know about this coming election. Unfortunately, Eric is not with us. He has um, some other plans and meetings and stuff. He's a busy guy. I'm sure that's what he'd want me to say. <laughs> but um, let's get going. So we've got a couple guests calling in very soon. We've got Howie Hawkins of the Green Party, who is running for New York State Governor. Um, coming up in a couple minutes, and then later on, at towards the end of the podcast, we will have Larry Sharp of the Libertarian Party calling in to answer some questions. He's also running for governor of New York State. So, there's a lot of, um, I feel like this midterm election's, like, one of the most important elections that I've seen, at least in my lifetime, com- not as much as the 2016 presidential elections, but... If it's not as important, it's definitely more important to get out there and vote for the midterms because a lot of the positions you're voting for are um, definitely affecting you more as a citizen. You're voting for a lot of local legislation, like local candidates, stuff that's directly affecting you, much more so than um, the presidency or anything federally can affect you. So um, let's get to it. So in 2014... Only 36.7% of voters turned out for the midterms compared to the 57.5% in 2012 and the 58% in 2016. So there's almost like, I mean, that's almost half of what turned out for presidential elections. And um, I think this time around for the midterms, we're going to see a, a big, big hike, a big spike in those numbers coming over the midterms. It's being covered a lot more by the media, I think, more so now than ever. So, um... I think we should get uh, the first guest on the podcast. Let me um, give uh, Mr. Hawkins a call. Hello? Hello, Mr. Hawkins? Yep. Nico Toliano, we're actually live on the Superlative Podcast right now. Okay. All right. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Good, good, good. Are you uh, ready for um, tomorrow's election? Yep, I'm all ready. Yeah. What are you most excited for for tomorrow? What um, what is um kind of like your ritual? Because you've ran for um, governor um the past um two terms, the past two times. Yeah, 2010, 2014, and this year. What do you think is more different um in 2018 than the uh, previous years? Uh, the newspapers have been decimated. Yeah. They don't have many reporters. I mean, I showed up at uh, the Ithaca Journal, a daily newspaper, because they didn't show up at a news conference, so I went over to their office, and it said on the door, we don't have office hours. Yeah. And it turns out they've got one and a half staff left. They do a story a day, and the rest is boilerplate. Uh, from USA Today, it's printed out of town and shipped in. The Daily News lost half their, they got fired uh, half their staff during the campaign. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a big difference. And uh, we got less coverage than we got in 2014. We were just completely out of the narrative, which was, I think the media was starstruck with Cynthia Nixon and when she lost the primary. Mm -hmm. And the first poll came out with Cuomo way ahead. They just stopped covering it. Do you think... Um, I think I, the polls show Cuomo um, surging well ahead, but do you think there's, um, I don't know, anything that uh, like somebody from like the right side could have done better to shrink that lead, or even more so any third party? Well, I think if I had been in the narrative of the media mm-hmm. during the primary, I think we would have got some traction. Cynthia Nixon, I don't think, represented progressive... Uh, positions very well. For example, on the single-payer health care bill, she told the Daily News editorial board when they asked her how you're going to pay for it, she said, well, we'll pass it, then we'll figure that out. Mm-hmm. And actually, the how you pay for it is in the bill. And when Governor Cuomo said in their debate, how am I going to find $200 billion? It's less than that, but even if that's what he said, the answer is in the bill, Governor. It's a progressive payroll tax, a progressive tax on unearned income, in other words, interest, dividends, and capital gains, and the tax money we already pay to Medicare and Medicaid. And 98% of us would pay less than we do now between the taxes for Medicare and Medicaid 
and the premiums, copays, deductibles, and out-of-pocket expenses for uncovered service that we have with our limited insurance that we got now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there could have been better answers. And I think on the climate uh, question, she took the wrong position. She's back in the bill, which has passed the assembly four times now, that really is just uh, codifies Cuomo's energy policy. And it's totally inadequate to the climate emergency. For example, it says right in the bill, we want to stabilize carbon equivalents in the atmosphere at 450 parts per million. That's about a dozen years out of date. Mm -hmm. I mean, the goal now is to stay below 350 parts per million. That's why we have this organization, 350.org. And then in the bill it says, uh, and this is Cuomo's goal, let's uh, get half of our electricity from clean energy by 2030. Well, electricity is only 28% of the carbon footprint. So, okay, you achieve that goal, that reduces it 14%. But the bill and Cuomo's policy allows these frack gas power plants to be built. Just the competitive power ventures plant down in Orange County, which was permitted with bribes to Joe Prococo, Cuomo's closest aide, adds 10% back into uh, our carbon footprint in the state. So the net just between that one plant and reaching that goal of 50% reduction or 50% of clean electricity by 2030, you only reduce greenhouse gases 4%. It's totally inadequate. And we have a bill with Green's help, right, called New York Off Fossil Fuels, which has benchmarks and timelines and a whole plan to get us to 100% by 2030, which is what the climate science says. So it was very frustrating for me not to be able to point these things out because the media was just not covering us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, back to that. Um, so more or less um, affording like a lot of the health care bills and um, try to invest in these other things. Um, besides raising taxes, are there any other like things you um, could think of to generate more revenue into New York State because we are like the top 10 in um, tax states across the United States. Well, two things to say about that. One is building out the clean energy system uh, creates hundreds of thousands of good jobs in manufacturing and construction. That's a lot more payroll. You can get revenue off of that. Mm -hmm. Plus, it would lower the cost of electricity in about half because you don't have to buy fuel anymore. You're just harvesting the energy all around us, the wind, the sun, the water. So um, it has an economic stimulus. But we need more revenues. Our infrastructure is crumbling. Mm -hmm. 1,837 bridges are structurally deficient. That's a $67 billion bill right there. You need $40 billion to get the subways in New York City running on time Mm -hmm. in 10 years. You need $32 billion to uh, fix up the New York City Housing Authority, get the the rats and roaches and mold and lead out and get the elevators, the boilers, and the, uh, and the roofs working again. So we need to raise revenue. Now, in this state, the top 1% got 12% of all income in 1980. Today, they get 33%. And their taxes have been cut. So we need to raise taxes on the rich, and we need to provide tax relief to the working class, which means a more progressive tax structure Back in 1980, the lowest uh, tax bracket was 2%. Now it's 4%. So we're paying twice as much on those first dollars we earn. And then the property taxes have gone through the roof because the state doesn't pay for its mandates on local government, like Medicaid. That's the biggest one, but there are a bunch of others. And that's so basically the state is balancing its budget on the backs of local property taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And that's a high cost for small businesses and regular folks. Now, I know so, a, lot of, a lot of times that, um, like, the number one go-to would be tax the rich, but what happens because many, many citizens, they leave New York State, like, like a lot, and they go to other states like North Carolina and Florida, but what, what will stop, like, what do you propose that will stop, like, some of the rich from moving out, especially when the taxes get raised even higher than they already are? The problem we have is not the rich leaving, it's the working class. A million people have left since Cuomo came to office. They're not a million millionaires in New York State or billionaires. Mm. So that's not the issue. The issue is lowering the cost of living and raising the wages and getting good jobs here. Mm. And look, the rich are making their money here. If they leave, somebody else is going to make that money. And even Tom Galasano, who left here and is, you know, a famous example, 
he's running around the state complaining about property taxes for the property he still owns here. He's still got to pay income tax on the money he makes here, paychecks, which is his company, has a lot of business here. So he's still paying taxes. Mm -hmm. All right, a little bit of a... A little bit of a segue because I saw an interesting article from freedominthe50states.org that ranks New York State the lowest in freedom among all states in the United States. And um, that's actually a big concern of mine. And I feel a, a few of our viewers, um, because we feel like everything is make a law for this, make a law for that. And um, for somebody who's more um, libertarian, um, more laissez-faire government, what would you say to um, how could we institute some more freedoms to um, everyday New York citizens? Well, we could start with criminal justice reform. We are the marijuana arrest capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And in the last year, 93% of those arrests were of black and Latino people. And of course, you get that on your record, you have a hard time getting housing, employment, education. So then we have a, you know, a dual justice system. When Joe Prococo, who took those bribes for the competitive power of interest plant in was Cuomo's aid, or Elaine Collieros, who did the bid rigging for the Buffalo Billion, or Dean Skelos, the leader of the Senate, or Sheldon Seaver, Silver, the Speaker of the Assembly. When they were charged, they didn't stay in jail. They went home before their trial. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you had the case of Khalif Browder, 16-year-old kid in the Bronx, accused of stealing a backpack. He refused to cop a plea. He said, I'm innocent. He spent three years in Rikers Island, two of them in solitary confinement. He got beaten by guards and some of the gangs in there because he wouldn't cop a plea and he couldn't make bail. So he spent three years in jail and then the DA dropped the case for lack of evidence. I mean, where's the freedom in that or the equal justice under law? So we need to abolish cash bail. If somebody's a threat to public safety, keep them until their trial. But the trial should be speedy, like the Sixth Amendment says. That's what we call Khalif's Law. It was proposed last year. They couldn't get it through. But that would prevent the prosecutors from delay, delay, delay. And then we need open file discovery. So if you're accused, you can get the evidence against you and prepare your defense. And then we got to have real funding of public defenders so people can have good counsel. It's really uneven between the counties where it's located now. We need a state public defender's office with an independent board overseeing it. So it's independent of the uh, prosecutors. So those are some of the, I mean, that's, that's for starters right there. Yeah, and then um, a little bit more of a segue. I know you brushed up about um, marijuana. So what would your take be on um, marijuana legalization? Yeah, legalize, tax, and regulate it. And regulate it, set up the market so these big, you know, big pharma or big tobacco or big alcohol doesn't run it. But, you know, people can start up small businesses. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, have a competitive market with lots of players. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so also let all the farmers produce it. I mean, right now we got this, uh, they they got experimental hemp, mm -hmm. which, you know, you, you, you can't get high if you ate the whole field. Um, but, you know, it's a, great, it's a great product for food and fuel and fiber. But uh, it's still regulated like it was a narcotic. Yep. It's crazy. And... You can't do it unless you get permission from the state. That should, should be legalized too, and let any farmer grow it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back to even more into small business, a little bit of segue there, because I'm a small business owner here out of Niagara Falls, and what sort of um, legislation, or I guess um, taking away of regulation and legislation, would you do to help smaller businesses be able to commute, co compete with some of the large businesses? Well. If you point out regulation that favors big business over small business, I'm with you for changing that. Mm -hmm. I think what we got to do for small business in any business is lower the cost of doing business mm -hmm. because our costs are so high here. Energy, if you go public power on average around the country, it's 13% less than an investor-owned utility, an IOU. Um, Single-payer health care, the payroll costs will be 5% less with single payer than they are now if you provide uh, insurance for your employees. Um, broadband, I mean, Spectrum and these other few uh, oligopolies are ripping us off way beyond the cost of providing the service they do and they're not providing good service. We should have community broadband 
where the community elects the board, the board oversees the delivery of the service, more accountability. There are over 200 examples around the country. Chattanooga is probably the most famous. And there was a study out of Harvard earlier this year. The community broadband systems provide better service at lower cost. And then I would like to see a state bank like they have in North Dakota, which partners with community banks. Instead of having a few big banks out of Wall Street, you know, they come and look at your financials. They have no idea about your character, your work ethic, your social relationships, and, and even the local market, whereas a community banker would. And they have many more community banks uh, per capita by far in North Dakota, and they partner with the state bank. And they do all the farm and business and mortgage lending there, plus infrastructure. And the finance costs are half of what it is going through Wall Street because you don't have to pay your fees, commissions, and interest to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. The interest comes back to the state, and the bankers for the state are working at civil service salaries, not these ridiculous salaries that the Wall Street banks give to their people. So that would be another way to lower the costs uh, when you've got to borrow for your business. So I think that's the way to go, lower the costs of uh, doing business. Now, regulations... You know, I, I'm involved with a food co-op here, and we got a lot of regulations, you know, health department and so forth. And sometimes it's a pain, but, I, you know, every, every time I look at one of those regulations, it makes sense for, for reasons of public safety. So I guess, you know, I'm for good regulation, I guess the way I'd wrap mm -hmm. that up. Okay. Not stupid regulation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or biased regulation, you know, things that favor, you know, the players that are politically connected. Mm. So and then another thing um, that's pretty popular, especially among young voters right now, is um, you see a lot of um, school shootings and mass shootings being covered by the news. Um, like in New York State, what can we do to prevent um, some of these shootings, but as well as preserve uh, the Second Amendment rights that we do have as a nation? Well, the, the first thing we have to recognize is that the number of people killed by gun violence in this country is off the charts compared to every other country, including some of those that are at war. But, I mean, the only ones worse than us are usually countries that are at war. So they're a different kind of violence. Um, the mass shootings are usually by somebody who uh, doesn't have all their marbles. So we've got to find a way to make sure that people like that um, don't have access to guns. But... Uh, I think another big issue is most deaths from guns are suicides. Yes. And so where are the services for people that are in, in crisis, particularly mm -hmm. veterans? We've lost more veterans to suicide or more military people to suicide since we got involved in the Middle East than we have from combat in the Middle East. Yeah, I agree. I believe and then we got, a lot of it is a men yeah. mental health issues, of, of course, with a lot of these um, deaths. And a lot of it is uh, people get, you know, very despondent when they lose their livelihood, whether it's taxi drivers in New York City or dairy farmers upstate or all the factory workers that used to have decent jobs around upstate mm -hmm. and don't now. A lot of those people are uh, committing suicide. So, you know, you, you find that the correlation of gun violence is inequality and loss of livelihood and then militarism. So I think... The first thing to do is address the root causes of why we have gun violence. And gun safety regulations, you know, I think we need some. I'm, I basically want to work within the framework of the Heller decision. You have a right to your uh, rifles and pistols and shotguns if you're law-abiding. Mm -hmm. okay. But we also have uh, a right to have reasonable regulation for public safety. And, of course, the devil is in the details on those things. So even something that you know makes a lot of sense on the surface the way it's implemented might be a problem so mm -hmm. you know like i said the devil's in the details yeah, a question did come in is um would you consider um abolishing the safe act outside of new york city to um a lot of people in upstate and western new york well we'd have to go through each piece of it um but i, I think it's effectively been abolished because the sheriffs do not want to uh enforce some of those laws. It's mm -hmm. not a priority for them. Mm -hmm. And they don't. So it's effectively abolished. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the implementation of it has been racially biased. The Democrat and Chronicle ran a story uh, a 
few years ago, but a few years after the SAFE Act passed, and an unbelievably high percentage of the prosecutions under the SAFE Act were inner city black and Latino uh, people. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's another thing. When you mm-hmm. when you pass a law, you got to make sure it's equally uh, administered, or that becomes a problem. Mm-hmm. This is true. So um, one last question, and then I'll let you go. I know you have a big day ahead of you tomorrow. Um, so kind of like a little off topic, but um, just a question that I came up with is, um, what is one thing that you would like like to work with President Trump on, or one um compliment you could have towards his policies? Not not rhetoric. I know we could get into a lot about rhetoric, and then uh, one critique you have just on policy as well. Well, that's the toughest question I've got the whole campaign <laughs> because I mean it's hard to get beyond Trump's racism and division of this country. Yeah, that's why we're talking just, just I think policy he's a, because we've got a, he's a, a great he, economic growth right now. Huh? Uh, we, we're, everybody's seeing great economic growth, whether it's the Dow or the low unemployment rate. So would you um, compliment some of his economics, economic policies so far? I wouldn't give him credit for those things. I think that that was underway. I mean, it's the same basic uh, dynamic we saw under Obama. You did um, see a very high surge. But a lot of the office. jobs are low income, minimum wage jobs. People got to work two or three of them to make ends meet. You go into a neighborhood like I live in, over 40% of the working age adults aren't working. They're not in the unemployment statistics because they've given up or it's hopeless. You know, they have criminal records, uh, they're disabled, or they can't get access to jobs. Like I've worked at a UPS hub for 18 years, Mm -hmm. and I have a car, but over half the people in my neighborhood can't afford a car. So if they've got a job, it's on foot or by bus. But there's no bus out to the UPS hub, which is, you know, a thousand workers out there. So, you know, I don't think the economy is working that well for the working class. Mm-hmm. In fact, we are the average inflation adjusted wage in this country is a dollar less than it was in January 1973. Meanwhile, the cost of rent, property taxes, health care, daycare, college have gone through the roof. So, you know, a lot of people, we have 100,000 people homeless in this state now, and only about 20,000 of them are people with mental issues or addictions and things like that. The other 80,000 are people that are down on their luck from the rent going too high and their jobs not paying enough. I mean, there are people in shelters who are have a job, but they can't afford rent somewhere, or they're in between because they got behind. So... You know, I don't think the economy is doing that well, particularly upstate New York, for working class people. It's, so I take it there's um, nothing really you would like to um, compliment um, President Trump on so far in his term? This guy is the same guy I read about in the Village Voice in 1978. He's a hustler, he's a con man, he's a liar. He's not a self-made man. He's living off his daddy's fortune and probably now money laundered from South American drug cartels and Russian oligarchs. I mean, you can't get, that's the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> I have to look into some of those ones. But um, Mr. Hawkins, I thank you so much for your time. I know you are um, got to be pretty busy with the elections coming up tomorrow. I wish you um, great luck and thank you so much for taking the call. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, but just to tell you, if you want to find out where he's getting his uh, or South American cartel money, look at uh, the tower in Panama, you know, the Trump Towers. They basically buy condos of cash, dirty money in, and they sell them clean money out. And same thing with uh, Trump properties in New York City with Russians. So I have to check that out then. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Ms. Hawkins. Um, wish you good luck tomorrow. Okay, well, thanks for having me on. Take okay. care. You too, thank you. All right. That was a pretty good call. Um, didn't really get to hear a lot from Howie Hawkins the past couple of weeks. But um, in the next in, um, 10, 15 minutes or so, we're going to have uh, Larry Sharp on to give more of a libertarian view of things. I know that was a Green Party that was a more so on the left side of the aisle, so it's going to be good in a little bit to get the right side of the aisle on. So I wanted to cover a little bit more about what more we're voting for tomorrow for the midterms. A lot of these things you show up to, right on um, 
right on voting day, you look at the ballot and then you see words like comptroller. You see words like attorney general. You don't really know what some of these terms are. So I've actually kind of got them, love to explain them a little bit more. So just for attorney general, the attorney general serves as the guardian of the legal rights of the citizens for New York, its organizations, and its natural resources. In his role as the state's chief legal counsel, the attorney general not only advises the executive branch of state government, but also defends actions and proceedings on behalf of the state. Uh, Keith Wolford is running the Republican Party. Latita Tish James is running Democrat. Michael Sussman is running Green Party. And Christopher Garvey is running as a Libertarian. So that's the Attorney General. And then another one you see almost every time on the ballot is the Comptroller or Controller. Couldn't really get a, um, an exact pronunciation of that word. But that's the state's chief accountant or financial officers. And each county individually has a Comptroller. So they oversee the state budget, audit state finances, ensures the state's tax dollars are being well spent and not um, being wasted through fraud or abuse. Um, pay state employees, oversees pension funds, prepares financial reports to the states, examines government contracts. So anytime there's a government project that needs to be done, they sort through the bids, the construction bids, or anything related to that. Collect taxes and funds to pay for state programs. <coughs> educate state citizens about tax issues. And some of the candidates are incumbent uh, Thomas DiNapoli of the Democratic Party, Mark Dunlay of the Green Party, Kruger E. <coughs> Gallaudet, sorry for mispronouncing that one, of the Libertarian Party, then Jonathan Triker of the Republican Party. Now if you guys want to see like who you side with on all these things, I would go to isidewith.com and that's going to give you who you align with most based on policy. Because I never recommend you should never vote based on I'm a Democrat I should vote Democrat I'm a Republican I should vote Republican I highly recommend it I do not recommend that whatsoever go to isidewith.com so you could really vote based on policy because that's I think that's a big thing we should be doing like now going forward as like young voters millennial voter voters voting based on policy not based on party and again if you want to see who you are voting for where the polling location is, you have to visit. Got that here in a second. I believe voting411.org. I'll find that in a second. Yeah, voting411.org. So. So basically, as a nation now, um, a lot's up for grabs as a nationwide. So this is why this is more important than a presidential campaign is because we're voting for um, the legislative branch, senators, um, congressmen, stuff of that matter. So in the House, all 435 <laughs> seats are up for grabs. How's it going? We have a, Eric has just showed up. Eric? We have a guest. I'm, I'm, I'm no guest, but... I just watched it. Yeah, that, was, that was a good conversation you guys were having. Yeah, man. I talked to Howie Hawkins. I know. I just watched the whole thing. That was cool. What, what camera? Is that the camera yeah. I'm looking at? Either. This is the live yeah, one. Yeah. That was... Uh, I like some of the stuff he was saying. I also disagree with a lot of the stuff he was saying, but... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Do we want to talk about that a little bit before we get our next call in? Or? Yeah, we should get the call in hopefully in nine minutes <coughs> coming up. I think it's yeah. really punctual. I was just talking about everything up for grabs in the midterms. As in, clue me in, let's hear it. So, all 435 seats are up for grabs in the House. That means, now, of course, well, I'm going to explain what the House does. The House is a more national, like, establishment. It, um, elections are every two years for the House, and they're more directly accountable to the people because it's every two years. So the right, House right. makes and passes federal laws and then initiates impeachment proceedings and originates revenue bills. So if you're, you're going to see a lot of um, push, especially from Democrats pushing to get control of the House and the Senate because they handle impeachments. And then you're going to see a lot more trying to impeach President Trump. I think that's the big right. push right Do you now. think that could be a possibility, like a real possibility or no? Impeachment? Yeah. I don't think there's any solid evidence, no? <laughs> any solid evidence to impeach so President Trump. Unless, right. unless some comes out in the future, which I... I don't think is likely. Yeah, probably not. What would you need? Like, how drastic? It would have to be, I think it needs to be a crime. It right? has, An to, be, actual it has crime. to be a crime, and it has to go through due process to actually establish that it was, by <laughs> right. a judge, a crime. Even if, uh, what's he, what's he laughing at? 
even if, um, I mean, even if the, you know, everyone goes against them, you can't. Like, even if it was 100%. Yeah, you'd need, you need concrete, rating. concrete evidence. Or, yeah, it couldn't. E but even once you get into the impeachments, if you know it's like <coughs> cut and dry that you're going to get impeached, most resign. Right, then. absolutely. So I don't think we'll ever even <coughs> see an impeachment in, no. our, in our day. No. So all the seats of the House are up for grabs. And then for the Senate, the Senate's a more federal. Elections are held every six years. So not all 50 seats. There's two senators per state. Right. And then the House is based on the population of the state. So um, Senate <laughs> elections are every six years. So they're less accountable, less accountable to the people. And again, they have the power to impeach government officials, power to approve by a two-thirds vote, treaties made by the executive branch <coughs> would be um, the president. And the Constitution provides that the president shall nominate and by and with the advice of the consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, of other, uh, other public ministers, <coughs> councils, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States. So... This is really big if another judge opens up another judge slot like we just had with Cannavaugh right, comes yeah. in. So someone like Cannavaugh, if Democrats took control of the Senate, would most likely not pass through and would have to wait either towards the end of Trump's presidency to reelect somebody based on who took office after Trump. Okay. So and more elections just going on. Now. Yeah. Vote411.org is the website, by the way. Go see exactly who you guys are voting for? for. That's to see where you're going tomorrow to vote, the times okay. that are open to vote. Now, can and people just go to, where do people go to vote? It, it could be anywhere. Based on where you live, there's a select location. Oh, I know. And it t that website tells you it where tells to go. It tells you where to go okay. and what times and then who exactly you're voting for because someone I'm voting for out in Youngstown may not be someone like you're voting for in Lewiston or even, like it's that close sometimes. Like, what do you mean by that? So... Depending on where like lines are drawn for dis certain districts, oh, like we could be okay, voting yeah, for different absolutely. people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I know um, a lot of state senators are up for grabs. I know in my um, district, um, Senator Ort is running against somebody from the Green Party. I'm not sure, but as a New York State Senate, um, Kristen Gillibrand is up for re-election against um, Chaley Farley of the Republican Party. So that's one that um, everyone in New York State's going to vote for. And then um, state senators with um, assemblymen by the district. So that's more or less like the legislative branch for New York State. So right. you're, whoever is in your district, you're voting for them to be like a house of rep just for New York State. Okay. So a lot of these elections have way more to, they have more of an immediate effect on you than anything like presidential or federal. So that's mm -hmm. why it's, it's more, more immediate. That's it's why it's more, so much more immediate. You feel it because, you know, I always say it feels like a president could be in office for eight years and you don't feel much of a change. Yeah, you know, you no. feel nothing. Mm -hmm. People are always worried about it, but you really no yeah, bad, I know. no good I feel like a president right it just kind of like puts out like how patriotic you feel. It's more of like like a sense of like patriotism that's portrayed. I always think of the, and this might sound crazy, I always think of the president like uh, you're voting for the best mascot every year. Yeah. Like you're, voting, like you're voting for a different mascot mm -hmm. every year with each president. It's a popularity contest in some cases. Yeah. I mean, now it is 100%. Mm -hmm. I like just um, having, like, it just be a king and queen. And, that just be the, and then having... Cause yeah. Because I'm more of libertarian, so I'm more of breaking up um, government and giving more power to smaller local government. Yeah, less hands-on. So, yeah, less hands-on. It gives local government... Um, more freedom to actually put in laws that affect their citizens. Okay. Because what happens in Washington, D.C. isn't what happens in Niagara Falls. It isn't what happens in, like, Dayton, Ohio. It's, it's not what not happens the small, in yeah, the yeah. small communities. Because especially even, like, Buffalo to New York City, there's so many different aspects. Like, not one governor could, like, put one thing in place that's going to, like, a one-size-fits-all. Yeah, it's So impossible. that's why it's important to go out, vote for your local senators, your local... Assemblyman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the big guy in. who's overseeing anything, it's impossible to please everyone. Yeah, you can't even get mad at it, it's yeah. impossible. Yeah, so the House and the Senate are all up for grabs. In the Senate, a third of the 50 seats are up for grabs, which most of them are being defended by Democrats. So, um, and many of those seats were in Trump supported areas, so the, okay. the Republicans may get a larger hold on the Senate. But hmm. um, the House is 100% up for grabs, so there's going to be some interesting races, I know. Obama, the Clintons, they're all out campaigning for the Democrats as well as Trump's out there yeah. campaigning for everybody. I think he was in Cleveland today, no? Yeah, I didn't even see that. Yeah,
He's like, really like crazy. But another thing I was talking about, which I mentioned to Howie Hawkins, is this, um, I don't know if it's just done every four years, but they rank the states based on freedoms. And it's, I did hear a little bit of that. It's 30.4% based on fiscal policy, so finances, economics. Regulatory policy is 34%, and then personal freedoms is 34.1%. Now, this goes down to like marriage equality, um, gun rights, legalization. And when you say freedoms, you're speaking actually on the legitimate meaning of freedoms or on happiness? Freedoms. Like, like freedoms. I'm free to carry okay. like an assault rifle. I'm free marry to smoke, same sex. To marry same sex, okay. I'm free to smoke marijuana. So this is based on that and how much of money the state takes from you. And 34% of the people in New York feel that way? No, no, no. This is what the, um, the study's based on. Oh, okay. So okay. And out of those three main categories, which they're broken up a lot, New York State ranks 50th in freedom. So Jeez. we are the least free state in the That's entire night. In the entire crazy. United States of America. What aren't we free in? What do you feel unfree in? Well, a lot of them, um, I think, we're the he- most heavily, one of the most heavily taxed states. I know that. So that that is a third of it right okay. there. So that puts a big strain on it. We don't, we haven't legalized um, marijuana in any sort oh, of matter. Okay, okay. And then as well as like something like the Safe Act, which rest- heavily restricts yeah. boom, most boom, most, boom. Yeah, most okay. firearms. So even just, I can't have a shotgun with a pistol grip. Like that's and illegal. People feel unfree about. So that. it's like just this much of a difference. Okay. So that's just like a little bit of the freedom getting taken away. And I did think, he speak on gun control at all? Second um, Amendment. Howie Hawkins. He said it's to dive deeper into it and see like what the root cause is, which I believe in. A lot of it does have to do with mental illness. Absolutely. Most most gun related deaths are suicide by an overwhelming majority. So you have to. Yeah, and you need to get those people help. I would yeah, like absolutely. To which talk another to thing I didn't get to um, that, talk yeah. about is the opioid ac- epidemic. Oh too, yeah. Right which I think actually um, legalizing marijuana could help with that a lot too. Right. So like maybe like, maybe people getting addicted to opioids got addicted to a lot of other things in the past. Yeah. Like um, painkillers, like oxycontin stuff like that. So if you could actually prescribe these people a safer alternative like marijuana, yeah. they won't get. It. And I'm on your side, but to play devil's advocate, a lot of people say that's a gateway drug. I personally don't believe that, but you hear that argument. Yeah, but I mean, oxycontin's a gateway drug too, yeah. and it's 100 yeah, percent FDA approved, and that's something that. A lot of, like, like breaks up a lot of families just addicted yeah. to those painkillers. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's not fun. Yeah, so hopefully Larry Sharp calls in Ooh, momentarily. That was very loud. I apologize. Oh, man. So, yeah, uh, how'd you feel about the conversation? You guys were it was good. Um, dialect of what I heard. Yeah, he had a lot to talk about. He said he wasn't getting as covered as much. Um, by the media because of the whole Cynthia Nixon, Andrew Cuomo thing. Okay. Because Cynthia Nixon was a celebrity before she ran. Yeah. But um, couldn't really beat Cuomo. Cuomo kind of bullied her out of there. Because okay. I don't even think they had a debate, which I could be wrong. They actually, hmm. they did have a debate? They did have a debate. I'm sorry. I got confused. Um, and then Cuomo and Molinero recently had a debate, which that's why I didn't even get to tell that story yet. Just be honest. Um, so the whole podcast came to um, fruition, this whole, like, it was really all last minute, this happened, like, yep. within, like, yep. 24 hours, was I wanted to have um, Mark Molinero on, because he was in Niagara Falls this past weekend, so I actually emailed his campaign, and maybe to set some other things, I'd probably get more people on, mm-hmm. just to, because I wanted to spark a conversation like this, because we, it's reach, important. we it's reach important. a young demographic, so it's And important. a lot of the young demographic that we reach don't think it's important to vote, exactly. especially but, for Or they candidates. get told by celebrities, which is... Yeah, a just bunch brainwashed. Of BS. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to listen to celebrities. Vote for yourself. Vote, vote based on your policy. Go with iSight. What's the yeah. website? iSightWith.com. Yeah, keep going though. Yeah, so talk to Molinero's people. Then um, Miss Delgado from his one of his campaign um, people met, emailed me last night saying, yeah, we could get him on just a phone call tomorrow, which is right now. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, we couldn't make it. So I said, all right, yeah. So I called you up and mm-hmm. we tried to organize it try to get more people to call in and then just recently apparently um he was unable to call in yeah she said he she um couldn't do anything past 10 o'clock busy night or busy day the she said she wanted him well rested for tomorrow which i don't know larry sharp was doing he just did a three hour um live stream and now he's going to call in momentarily to us hey. so he's working and then mr hawkins just called in pretty late at night so oh, yeah all right this might be him yeah this is um Hello, this is Nico and Eric. You're on the Superlative Podcast. What's going on? It's Larry Sharp. How are you? Hey, Mr. Sharp. How are you? How's it going? I'm doing great. 
Great. Um, yeah, we actually um, met when you were at University of Buffalo a couple weeks back. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm, I look, the podcasts are awesome. Yes. What do you what do you what do you want to talk about tonight? Um, pretty much anything. We wanted to talk more about like um, because we reach a very young demographic. So um, mm-hmm. so more or less like uh, one question that I had was um, if you were like somebody in a, like our shoes in your early twenties, maybe you just graduated from college, you wanna think about starting a businesses or you think about ch- jumping in a career. What would be your main concern as a New York State resident? Okay, you're asking if I was a youngster. Yeah. Say so you're um just in college or just graduated from college um, what would be your main concern like in, like especially with the upcoming elections what would you want to look for you mean okay I'm, I'm, are you asking for like my career or are you asking for someone to vote for no like what would be like a main like policy concern of yours if you were in our shoes Opportunity, my friend. That's the only thing I care about, particularly small business. Mm -hmm. Particularly small business. Opportunity is everything. Look, if you're a youngster, when are you going to find your stride? What what if you're a young person, you're 20-something, you're looking for purpose, you're looking for community. You you rarely find that in big business. You become a number in big business. You want some of the youngsters are unhappy in big business. You 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 want a reason to get up in the morning and go out and do stuff. That's what you want. And what does that mean? You want to have something like, as an example, you want to be in something like cryptocurrency, or you want to be in hemp or cannabis. You want to be in um, the vaping industry. You want to be in something cool and new with a chance to make real money, a chance to make some impact. That's the kind of thing you want. You want to grow. You want to be able to be someone who's not just a cog in a wheel, but who can make some decisions and be part of something. That all happens in small business and innovative businesses. That's what I'd be most concerned about. That's a good one. Why do you think, um, like, things like blockchain and especially Bitcoin have been so just crushed by the government. Yeah, it's not crushed by the government, it's crushed by New York State government because mm-hmm. New York State loves old money. That's what New York State loves, right? They love old bankers. That's good stuff. Anything new becomes bad, right? We don't like that. We don't understand it. So we go right to law and we begin crushing it. We crush it with regulation. Mm-hmm. Officially, big licenses exist. Officially, medical marijuana exists. Officially, hemp exists. Officially, you can do all three of those things in New York State. Officially, medical marijuana is a thing, but no, it isn't. It's so regulated that no one except for people who are big business can in any way, shape, or form deal with it. That's how New York State crushes it. And why do you think that is, Mr. Sir? Why do you think that what? is? New York State is so focused on uh, keeping marijuana illegal. Why do you think that is? Yeah, there, there are two things I mentioned. One, because we like old money. But two, because there, there's cronyism, right? It's my boys have a have a monopoly on this, so why in the world would I change it, right? My guys are running the way I want it to run. My big right. farmers are paying me big money. Why would I want to give a small farmer a chance? Yeah, it's yeah. literally self-preservation for those people in charge. Mm, that's right. true. Yeah, so we just had um, Howie Hawkins on, actually, a little bit ago. So I'm just going to ask some of the same questions. Because I saw um, freedominthe50states.org had New York State ranked last in freedoms. That is correct. Yeah, what what would you do as governor to uh, eliminate some of like the regulations and restrictions that um, everyday New York citizens have? That's a that's a seven hour question. <laughs> I know. Just, um, maybe top two. Seven hour question. I mean, there's just so many. Um, yeah, top let two. me give you a let me give you a general rule when it comes to licensing and regulations. Here's my general rule: Would you ask your friend to do it? It's my general rule. So what does that mean? Would you ask your friend to say if you were if you had long hair? Uh, to braid your hair. Would you do that? Of course. Sure. So why is there a license? But there is a license right now in New York State. It will cost you $20,000 to become a hair braider. Would you ask your friend to walk your dog? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Why is there a license? Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Would you right. ask your friend to give you a kidney, to uh, I'm sorry, perform a kidney transplant? No. No. Exactly. Get a license. <laughs> so I'm saying, yes. So if you wouldn't ask will. your friend then get a license. If you would ask your friend, don't get a license. That's my general rule. And that should be what we go through every single license in New York State through and just go right down the line. I like that. I like yeah. that a lot. And, yeah, because um, yeah, I've heard like, a lot of you speak, especially on the Joe Rogan. So you have definitely hammered a lot of points like licensing rights or naming rights for um, bridges and everything. So I've got a couple different questions maybe that you haven't heard. So there's like a big thing, especially on Facebook and Google with censorship, especially of um, conservative thoughts. How could we combat? How could you combat that as governor in New York State? Uh, I don't think you combat it. I think you shine a light on it. The reality of it is if I want bad behavior to end, 
generally speaking, passing laws doesn't stop it. It's called the black market happens anyway. Uh -huh. But if you shine a light on it, generally speaking, people begin to stop. So, look, to be forward with you, Google is a private company. Facebook's a private company. If Facebook wants to censor stuff, it can. I don't like it. It actually hammered me today. Mm -hmm. it, shut down, it shut down my advertisements last night. I don't like it, but it has every right to do so. What do we do? We shine a light on it and show people this is bad behavior, that we don't want to accept it. When they start seeing that, what winds up happening? Well, guess what? They start changing. How do I know? I told everybody it happened. They started posting everywhere. All of a sudden, I have my ads back. Mm -hmm. That's how that works. So the goal is to shine a light on bad behavior. That's how it begins to change. The reason why Facebook's getting so bad is because we're threatening laws. Did you notice that Facebook got so bad the second he had a, that, that Zuckerberg and all the guys had to be in front of Congress? That's true. They, they got in front of Congress, and all they thought is, they're going to start regulating us. We better start doing good. So what did they start doing? Punishing us. Out of fear of laws. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. What should have happened is we should have shown a light on the bad behavior and they would have stopped it. Why? We're their customer base. I'm sorry, that's not true. In Facebook, we're not the customers. We're their product. Sorry, we're their product. They have a customer base. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're punishing their customer base now. So people are going to start leaving Facebook because they're going to punish their customer base. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So a little bit more of a segue. I actually asked... Um, Howie Hawkins this question. He didn't quite have an answer to it, and I'm actually not sure if you're going to have an answer to it, but um, I was asking him if he has one thing that he would like to say maybe good about um, President Trump's policy or something that you would like like to hop on and also implement into New York State. A policy that Trump has that I would like to implement in New York State. Or even just a compliment on any of his policies. And then also, later on in the question, one critique. Um, well, I like his, the, the plan he has, I don't know if it's, it's going to happen, the plan he has to cut spending and cut government, that's the plan. Mm -hmm. He hasn't done it, but that has been his plan. So if Trump does cut government at the end of his four years, as he promised, I'd be impressed. That'd be good. Yep. And then would you also be, um, because I, I hate how you see some of these campaigns and some of these, um, just the whole campaign is running based on I want to stop Donald Trump and do you think that's effective at all for any of these campaigns completely effective absolutely it, it's a great distraction mm -hmm. it's wrong and I hate it and I'm not doing it but the idea of I hate the other guy particularly when there's only two parties is very effective it allows the person who's saying it to not have any policies mm -hmm. just say I will protect you from the bad guy you see here in New York Cuomo his entire thing is I'll protect from Donald Trump that's all he's saying. And it's working. He wins every poll. Yeah, it works. Mm -hmm. I hate it, and it works. Mm -hmm. I know you see that a lot. And, um, so where are you right now? So what is your plan for the next um, the next day? Oh, I was just on a uh, three-hour um, radio yeah, show. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yes, um, now I'm with you. Then I'm going home and going to sleep. All right. And then what's That's the, what I'm doing. What's the Tomorrow, day? I'm doing a three-hour radio show again, here again, live, trying to get people to, uh, to uh, you know, still go off and vote. Mm -hmm. And then um, that night, I'm heading off to the Bronx, and that's going to be my uh, reception. Hopefully, my uh, my victory party. Yeah, hopefully. And then that's pretty much it. Do you have anything else? Do you have anything you want to add? No, no. I was just listening. I'm, you know, Nico. I'm not as informed as you, but. You know, just the way you speak and the uh, policies you spoke on with Nico, you know, it made uh, me want to go out and vote for you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There we go. Go yeah. out and vote for you tomorrow. You should do that. Please Absolutely. do that. It's a good Absolutely. idea. Yeah, because I was supposed to actually have, um, this podcast was supposed to be centered a little bit around um, Mark Molinaro, but last minute, like they said, he needed to rest and get some sleep, so he wasn't, he dropped out last minute. But I'm so That's happy. That, that, he's actually called No Show Mo. <laughs> I'm not joking. That happens so often. He drops out so often. He's actually called No Show Mo. Not, not you, though, Mr. Sharp. Not you. No. I do podcasts all the time. I do with the youth all the time because you guys are important. Oh, yeah. This is not just about me. I'm not just talking trash. This is about the future. Yeah, that's I why need to get you on my side. Yeah, that's why, because we wanted to, because we reach a young demographic, so we almost thought it was our responsibility to actually spread why the midterms are just as important, if not more important, than um, the presidential elections.
Why was this going to be a podcast around Malala, by the way? Because um, he was the first person to actually reach out to actually say he would be on. So we oh, did. that's nice. And then he bailed on you. That's yeah, nice. Pretty much. So I wanted to get okay. like, him and then somebody from the left side. And then I'm so thankful that you actually took the time to talk with us today. Oh, yeah. Now, of course, look, here's, a, here's something to remember. Here's how I want to leave this with you. If you are satisfied or happy with what um, His Majesty King Andrew II is doing, if you are, then vote either red or blue and you'll get him. If you vote Republican or you vote Democrat, he wins. So you will get him, and that's awesome, good for you if you like it. If you don't like what he's doing and you want change, there is only one option, and that is Libertarian. There is nothing else. Because if you vote Libertarian, one or two things will happen. One, I'll win, and if I win, I'll implement change. Or two, I'll come in second. If the Republican comes in second, nothing changes. That's happened for 16 years already. But if I come in second, there'll be a microphone in my face every single day saying, when I reach up, how the hell did you come in second in New York State? And I'll talk about all the things I talk about again and again and again, and we'll still have change. It'll be slower, but we'll still have change. Mm -hmm. If you want change, there's only one guy you can vote for, and you're talking to him right now. All right. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Again, if you want to check more of Mr. Sharp stuff out, visit his Joe Rogan podcast with him on Joe Rogan. It was absolutely oh, yeah. fantastic. Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Good luck tomorrow, Mr. Sharp. We're wishing you all the best. All right. Good luck. Have Mr. a great Sharp. day. Vote for me. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye. That was awesome, man. Yeah, he's very. I was, you know, I wanted to sit back and listen. You know, you're more informed than that, but I like a lot of the stuff he was saying. I like he's very he's charismatic. He's enthusiastic, and, and yeah. he's not like because I hate he when they, cool dude, I hate when people run their campaigns like, oh, I'm um, conservative, I'm Republican, I, this person's bad, get them out, or get yeah. Cuomo out. Um, vote for me or get Trump out vote for me like that's not how you you base you should I, vote based on policy like I, that's why like I relate a lot with um Larry Sharp because he has plans of actions and he has step by step what I'm going to do how I'm going to increase tax revenue how I'm going to cut your taxes I really like what he was saying about the license mm -hmm. that uh metaphor yeah, that, gave it goes, with that. It goes back really to why that. we're the least free state yeah. in the United yeah. States that was awesome that mm -hmm. was cool yeah so uh what do you think about it? You know, I wasn't really here for Mr. Hawkins, but... Uh, yeah, he just, um... He's actually ran for governor two times before as well. Okay. He just says, um... He was talking about how, like, the newspapers aren't... I would ask him, like, what's different, like, this time around? And he said, Cynthia Nixon kind of stole a lot of thunder. Yeah, yeah. As well as, um... There's no more newspapers, so there's different, like, media outlets. So I think that's why he probably took this call with us, because... Yeah. It's the future. Podcasting's the future. It's... Like, newspaper's gone, radio's the next thing out. Podcasting, right? yeah. Pod TV's gonna be you, out. You see it with music, people, when they're dropping an album, they make their podcast runs. Mm -hmm. Instead of the radio stations. Yeah, absolutely. It's I mean, crazy. Because you can listen to it any, any way you want. Yeah. At any time, too. Which yeah. is great. Yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately, I did reach out to Cuomo's people as well. and No answer. Nothing, and then I reached out to um, different elections, like Nate McMurray and Chris Collins' office, because they're um, yeah. running for congressmen and... I'd love like to see a uh, good old Larry win that. I know it's um, it's tough, especially in New York State. Yeah, yeah. But um, sure. it's like almost gives you hope, you know. Yeah, like, a little bit. Like a third party hope, which is, I think that's why people resonated with like the Bernie Sanders and the Donald Trumps because they weren't spewing the same like Democratic or Republican rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Rhetoric. They were yeah. spewing like ideas and change, and people love like hope and, and a bit change. Extremists on each side. And yeah, absolutely, more. definitely. Yeah. People resonate with the extremists. That yeah. sparks media attention and More conversation talk. but um yeah. but anyways get out there vote but before you vote make sure you know who you're voting for and why you're voting for them do not vote just i'm a republican i'm gonna vote republican i'm a democrat i'm gonna vote democrat there's third party candidates like larry sharp that maybe you have ideas with that you love or and maybe you won't even be a who knows i bet you you're gonna see a lot of change you're gonna see yeah, people drop yeah. from the democratic and the republican party and you're gonna see people go independent Libertarian, Green Party, Conservative, you're going to see a lot more spread, mm -hmm. I think, especially Because if everyone election. thinks there's no point in voting for a third party like that, mm -hmm. they're never going to win. But if everyone who thinks that mm -hmm. actually, you know, stands up and goes to vote... Which, and when the guys like that are taking this medium to get their message out yeah. there, it's going to get out there yeah. more effectively. Yeah. I like what a lot of stuff he was saying. Mm -hmm. Glad sure. I made it for him. Yes. But, uh, yeah. is there anything else to touch on? I think that's it. We'll, um... Shoot another podcast episode this week and hopefully tomorrow. Yeah, shoot it tomorrow. Hopefully it'll be out by Friday. Going to be a business podcast, so 
message us your questions, anything business related to entrepreneurship. We're going to have a guest on. We're going to cover yeah. all of those topics. But um, that should do it. Sorry I was late, guys. Won't happen again. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Spoiler Go vote podcast. tomorrow. All right, cool.